Welcome to the Earth Month 2022 episode of the Manga Bay Newscast. I'm your host, Mike Gorecki, bringing you the news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline. Every year on April 22nd, people around the world celebrate Earth Day. And now, the entire month of April is considered Earth Month, a month-long celebration of nature and a time to focus on how we can all contribute to a more sustainable and healthy planet. On this special Earth Month episode of the Manga Bay Newscast, we highlight the growing recognition of the role indigenous peoples play as the world's top conservationists. Scientists, governments, the UN, and the World Bank all agree on the outsized importance of indigenous-led conservation. In fact, a study by the World Bank showed that though indigenous peoples' traditional lands account for less than 22% of the world's land area, they actually protect 80% of the world's biodiversity. And this protection is not passive. Indigenous-led projects are a vital part of the conservation movement across the world. We discuss today several indigenous-led conservation projects here in the United States. In recognition of how vital indigenous-led conservation practices are to protecting our planet, there is a growing global movement to secure indigenous land rights. But the conservation establishment hasn't always prioritized the rights of indigenous peoples or even recognized their contributions to preserving nature whatsoever. We speak today with author Michelle Nyhaus, whose latest book, Beloved Beasts, is a history of the modern conservation movement. She tells us about the book and what it has to say about how indigenous communities and their traditional ecological knowledge have finally come to be seen as crucial to the cause of conservation. We also speak today with Dr. Julie Thorstensen, a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe and the director of the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society. She tells us that the 574 tribes in the United States manage more than 140 million acres of land, and that many have fish and wildlife management programs working to conserve and reintroduce endangered or declining wildlife, from bison and condors to salmon and ferrets. Yet these tribal programs receive no annual funding from state or federal governments in the U.S., though legislation currently before Congress might be about to change that. Tribes have this unique look on things, and I think that that type of holistic view has uh, been happening on tribal lands and in Indian country, but maybe been left out of the overall conservation movement. And I think that that's super important, but if you're not at capacity, or you're competing against other tribes, you're constantly competing for funding, it's, it's just really hard to, to get everything you want to get accomplished done. Michelle Nyhaus is an environmental journalist and the author of Beloved Beasts, Fighting for Life in an Age of Extinction, which has just come out in paperback. The book tells the story of the modern conservation movement from the late 19th century when humans first realized that their actions could and were driving animal species to extinction through to today as the invaluable contributions of indigenous peoples the world over are finally being recognized and supported by the conservation establishment. Here's Nyhaus with more background on the book and why she wrote it. In a way, I've been thinking about writing this book for more than 20 years, ever since I was a biology field assistant in the desert southwest, and I got up close and personal with a lot of the local battles over endangered species, and I saw how bitter those fights were, and I also saw how much people were talking past one another when it came to, you know, why are we saving the species? What is it good for? Why is this one better to, than another one? And I, when I became a journalist and started writing about conservation, I still, I kept seeing that dynamic happen. And I started to think it might be helpful to try and tell the larger story of the conservation movement, where the conservation has movement has been since the institutional movement started in the late 1800s, the mistakes it's made, the blind spots it's had, some some of the chronic blind spots it's had and and then where it might be able to go from here so the book tells the story of the modern conservation movement from the time that Europeans and North Americans first realized that it was possible for humans to drive species extinct which was kind of belated not until the late 1800s and then moves through the 20th century and and looks at how the conservation movement absorbed the lessons of ecology and conservation biology, but was slow to recognize the importance of the connections between humans and other species, and, and really ignored a lot of the lessons of 
the pre-existing forms of conservation practiced by indigenous people in rural communities long before the conservation movement ever took shape. So, so I profile some really fascinating, famous conservationists, none of whom were perfect, many of whom were brilliant, and, and look at how their stories fit together and how they built this tradition that uh, is definitely imperfect, has in some places and cases caused a lot of damage, but which has also accomplished some great things and that I think we can all learn from. Indigenous conservation is one of the blind spots the conservation establishment has had since its inception. Can you tell us a bit about that history, why and how the conservation world has ignored indigenous and community-led conservation? Well, the conservation movement was really begun by, not exclusively, but mostly begun by elite, wealthy, white sport hunters from North America, people who hunted for fun, for satisfaction, not for a living. And they genuinely admired the animals they they hunted. And, and they were prescient in, in many ways because they were saying something that the people in their society were not saying, which was, we need to protect these animals. These animals are vulnerable and we have a responsibility to protect them. But at the same time, they their reasons for wanting to protect them were all wrapped up with their ideas about protecting national pride, protecting white masculinity, which was thought to be endangered at the time. And they were very, as a rule, they were very dismissive of the needs of subsistence hunters, by extension, subsistence farmers, very distrustful of people's ability to sustainably live alongside other species. They really, for instance, William Hornaday, who was instrumental in protecting the bison from extinction, he was the director of the Bronx Zoo, really didn't, not only was dismissive of how devastating it was for Native American tribes on the plains to lose the bison, but he insisted that they were mostly responsible for the decimation of the bison when it was clear, even during his time, that white commercial hunters were responsible for that. So that was a a big oversight that caused, you know, has caused, I think, a lot of damage throughout the course of the conservation movement, because I think that while that bias is not expressed as overtly as it was during those early generations of the conservation movement, that discounting of local perspectives and local knowledge has in many cases remained. And, you know, when the conservation movement went international and and moved from Europe and North America into colonized territory. You saw conservationists working with colonial governments to establish national parks in places where people were already living and already had their conservation practices established. So in many cases, those parks disrupted existing conservation activities that conservationists from Europe and North America didn't bother to find out about, or if they did know about, didn't respect. Happily, we are seeing that changing even in in the last three to five years that we've just seen an explosion of interest in indigenous-led conservation within the conservation establishment. And, And we've also, and that has been developing over the last, I would say, 40 years. Beginning in Southern Africa in the 1980s, there was a realization among professional conservationists that, look, this is, we we need conservation to be happening at every level, at the local level to the international level, and to discount local expertise is not only wrong and, and causing a lot of heartache and, and real suffering, but it is counterproductive. <laughs> we need we need this movement to be as, as broad and inclusive as possible. So, so it's a, a slow evolution that I think has really accelerated in the past few years, which I'm very happy to see. What's been lost as a result of this blind spot towards indigenous and local conservation? What it led to in those early, and I should be clear, I'm speaking necessarily in generalizations. There are exceptions to everything I'm saying, but the the mainstream of the conservation movement in its early generations was focused on establishing protected areas, establishing parks and reserves to protect wildlife from people. And then later on, concerned with passing laws to protect, for instance, uh, migratory birds from overhunting, which was both of those things were crucial and continue to be crucial in protecting 
wildlife, especially high, highly endangered species. You know, without the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, we would not have many of the bird species that we really value today. That said, that I think that there has been a over-reliance on these top-down solutions, on national laws, on national parks, state parks, state reserves, and a lack, because of those early roots in elite hunting circles, I think there's been just a lack of attention um, or a lack of consideration of the role of local expertise in the conservation movement. You know, you can establish a national park (laughs) and draw a boundary somewhere, but without the support of the people who live around that park, that park's not going to succeed because, you know, I think morally no one wants a a militarized border around a national park and, and practically you know, no no border can be impermeable to people who want to get inside of it. So if you have people out, outside a park who, you know, have been deprived of their land and livelihoods and, and aren't likely to give safe haven to the animals that wander outside that park, aren't likely to respect laws against hunting, you have, you know, caused a lot of suffering for people. And also, you're not doing the job that you set out to do to protect these vulnerable species. And I think, so I think much has been lost both for habitats and vulnerable species and people. Um, And that's, you know, in North America and in the rest of the world, you know, we see it, we see it here in the States and, you know, we've seen it in Africa, Asia, many other places where parks have been imposed without doing the sometimes long and hard work of building local support and building a positive role for people to play in conservation. I think conservationists, as a, as a, again, speaking generally, have, have often forgotten that people of all walks of life are capable of playing a positive role in conservation. They've been so focused on the damage that we can do, which is, you know, understandably huge, that they distrust people's capacity for playing a positive role. But we need, you know, for conservation to succeed at a meaningful scale, we need people to be playing that positive role. In my time as an environmental journalist reporting on conservation for the past decade, I feel like I've definitely witnessed this greater recognition of the important role indigenous communities need to play in conservation. You write about some indigenous-led conservation projects in Beloved Beasts. For instance, you have a whole chapter on community conservation projects in Namibia, Would you say the projects you write about are emblematic of this shift in how the conservation world is viewing indigenous and community-led conservation? Yeah, I would say so. I'll talk about Namibia in a second, but just just as an example, here in North America, I think what's happening with bison restoration, even though that was initiated in the early 1900s by people who really did not take the tribes and First Nations connection to the Plains bison seriously at all. The happy irony is that now there's this continent wide, you know, very ecologically and culturally mindful effort to restore the bison at a much larger scale. And I I just think that's a terrific model for where conservation should be going because it's working with a species that's pretty healthy. It's not you know, in danger of going extinct, but it could be much healthier. It could be playing a much greater role in the ecology of the plains, and it could be playing a much greater role in in cultures that have been missing the bison for generations. And, and there are all kinds of really powerful examples from tribes and First Nations that have brought bison back to their place and have seen it return to both their land and to their culture in these really often unexpected ways, but all very powerful ways. And so something I think community led, that kind of community led conservation is actually better known outside North America. We do have some examples of it, but it really got its start in in Southern Africa and is now spread throughout the world where, as I said earlier, professional conservationists and and others realized this top-down or exclusively top-down approach is not what we need to be doing. And over time, um, in a very grassroots way, some conservationists in Namibia from, from various walks of life started to form projects that hired, for instance, local game guards to protect local species against illegal hunting and over time, that became this nationwide effort that restored 
some management authority to local communities that had really not had that authority since the days of colonization. They had had, of course, historically, you know, well-established conservation practices, but they had not had the authority to manage their own wildlife, their their local wildlife in any way. And by all accounts, by you know, all the people I, I spoke with during the weeks I spent in Namibia said, yeah, there, there was an attitude of this wildlife is being protected for wealthy white people, often wealthy white foreigners. It's being protected for their entertainment. And it's the government's responsibility. So when an elephant is you know, dest- destroying my crops or posing a danger to my kids, it's the government's responsibility to come in and take it away. <laughs> and once community conservancies started to grow and people had both an ability to benefit from conservation, they had they were able to partner with, for instance, with guiding operations and benefit from tourism. And they were able to you know, run their own campsites and things like that. And they were also able to be relieved of some of the burdens of living near wildlife that could sometimes be dangerous. They got some funding for fencing, things like that. That just shifted their relationship with wildlife enough that then they were very willing, These many of these communities were very willing to go to quite a bit of trouble to protect their species for the long term. I think, you know, I don't think there was anyone who questioned closely would say, oh, yes, I really want these elephants and rhinos to go extinct. But they would say it's, you know, we don't have the, we're not benefiting from from these animals in any way. They're just causing us trouble. The community conservancies, and again, they were built in this very grassroots collaborative way, shifted that balance so that people were not only willing, but able to do the work required to protect those species for the long term. And I got to see this in action and it was really quite, even though I'd heard a lot about collaborative conservation and seen it in action in some small ways, this was the first time I'd seen a nationwide, I'd seen it instituted on a nationwide scale. And it was really quite moving to see people, you know, having come from great distances during a drought year, sitting together during a long afternoon, arguing with each other. Well, how many you know, we've done these game surveys. How many animals should be hunted this year? Should we allow to hunt? Should we allow tourists to hunt? Should we allow ourselves to hunt for our own sustenance? What, you know, and, and just arguing over the details like this, it was, it really, it gave me a lot of hope that this kind of very local conservation can be, I knew it was an, an important part of the big conservation ecosystem, but it gave me hope that it it could successfully be incorporated into what we call, you know, institutional conservation and that, and that it could play the role that it, it should be playing in our collective effort to protect life on Earth. I would love to hear more about the bison. Can you maybe just back up a little and tell us about how bison almost went extinct and the development of this indigenous-led conservation movement to restore them continent-wide? You've said this is one of the most exciting things happening in conservation and that it's emblematic of conservation's successes and failures. And I'd love to hear about all of that. The urban public in North America first became aware of what was happening to the bison on the plains in the late 1800s. Um, bison had been you know, hunted really you know, without any kind of restriction for many decades. And in the late 1800s, the population really started to spiral toward extinction. And and this was almost unbelievable, I think, to many people living in, in cities on the East Coast and West Coast of North America, because they this was such a physically large and famously abundant species. They just kind of couldn't believe that it was about to go extinct. And and as I said earlier, it took people like William Hornaday, flawed as he was, to stand up and say, this is happening. It's it's wrong. And it's also not inevitable. Some people were kind of accepting it, but saying, oh, well, I guess this is what has to happen if we want national progress. He, was, he would say, no, it, it's not inevitable. And we have to do something about it. So he actually bred a herd of bison in the Bronx. <laughs> he was the director of the Bronx Zoo and had them shipped out by train to Oklahoma where they flourished. And And that was the kernel of one of several federal herds that we still have and that whose animals are still being used to seed some of these, these small herds that are being returned to reservations. So like I said, Hornaday ensured that the species, Hornaday and his allies, ensured that the species wasn't going to go extinct, but they didn't have much of a sense of ecology or any sense of ecology. They were just 
treating bison like livestock, kind of plunking them back on the prairie. And in the decades since, people have become much more aware that bison are this keystone species on the prairie. They had relationships with all kinds of plants and animals. And then tribes and First Nations have maintained their connection to the bison in many ways, but have also come, I think, have continued to appreciate just how much has been lost culturally. I mean, in, in the in the early years, many people, it was a huge practical and economic loss. Many people starved to death. And, and there are studies that show that those economic losses are in some ways still reverberating through these plains communities. And even though the economic losses are not as as urgent as they once were, there's still a, a huge sense of, of cultural loss because of the absence of the bison. So those two, the ecological awareness and the cultural awareness, I think, came together a few decades ago and tribal conservationists as well as conservationists from organizations like the Wildlife Conservation Society got together and started talking about, well, how can we, how can we further the restoration of the bison and make it make it more than just preventing extinction? How can we restore these relationships that have been broken and remain broken, these ecological relationships and cultural relationships? So that those meetings turned into this loose but very effective network of local projects that are supported by regional and national and even international cooperation because a lot of these projects are in Canada. There's even one in Mexico. And I think there's a real sense of we're all, you know, we're leading the way in restoring our own cultures, but we're also contributing to this much larger ecological restoration. So to me, all those elements are are very exciting. And again, I think something that can really be emulated in North America and elsewhere. So there is growing recognition of the key role indigenous communities need to play in conservation. And with that, there's a lot of grappling with the colonial legacy of conservation, as you've touched on. One particular recent flashpoint in that discourse is these 30 by 30 plans, which many countries have adopted. And it's essentially a pledge to conserve 30% of lands and waters by 2030. A global 30 by 30 target is expected to be pushed for by a group of countries at the Convention on Biological Diversity later this year, but there's been a lot of pushback to this target, with some saying that it will basically amount to a land grab by the same colonial forces at the expense of indigenous and local communities' access and rights to their land. How do you view the 30 by 30 goal within this broader context of the history of the conservation movement? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're I'm glad you asked about that. 30 by 30 is, and the conversation and debate around 30 by 30 is one of the reasons why I think it's so important for conservationists to know their own history. The 30, you know, at least the early supporters of the 30 by 30 plan were very explicit in their support for indigenous land rights and their support for the importance of indigenous led conservation. But I think that understandably, indigenous communities themselves have every right to be suspicious of far-reaching conservation initiatives that come down from the top. And there's a lot, you know, as we've been talking about, there's a long history of legal and moral violations of indigenous land claims and indigenous relationships with other species. So I think the fear is warranted. And I think that the supporters of 30 by 30 do need to do need to be much more aware of the need for guarantees. They need to be aware of the, you know, just really complete lack of trust, understandable lack of trust that that Indigenous communities have for far-reaching conservation initiatives. And they need to build in guarantees for people that, that they will, you know, retain or increase their, their land tenure and, and have a real role in conservation. I think now, as, you know, as the agreements are developing, they're as I said, there's a lot of acknowledgement that it's important, but there aren't a lot of guarantees. And the definitions, for instance, of what constitutes a conserved area are, are allow a lot of room for interpretation. And some of that, some of that fuzziness, I think, presents a threat to indigenous people and 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 they are rightly concerned. So All that said, I think that we really do need to have conservation happening at that international level. 
you know, as I said, I think if we're going to protect ecosystems, we need to, conservation itself has to be a functioning ecosystem. You know, we have to have that international level of conservation happening because species don't respect political boundaries. You know, we have to, we have to be coordinated and we have to be sure that we are protecting the amount of diversity and habitat that, you know, the planet needs to survive. But we need to do that with, with a real awareness of the mistakes that have been made in the past and the mistakes that still could be made in the future in terms of violating people's rights and, and in terms of just being ineffective when we, on the local level, the, the importance of gaining that local trust and support for, for conservation um, on the ground. Aside from debates over conservation policy like 30 by 30, another way that these issues of conservation's colonial legacy come to the fore is in how we remember and discuss some of the towering figures of conservation's past. You've already talked about William Temple Hornaday and his flaws, for example. And just recently, of course, E.O. Wilson passed away and subsequently news came out that he had corresponded and apparently supported a pretty prominent race scientist, which was hugely disappointing to many of us here at Manga Bay who have interviewed him and reported on his work over the years. E.O. Wilson even appeared on this podcast a few times. Another example is John Muir, famous naturalist and explorer and founder of the Sierra Club, who had quite problematic views about some of his fellow human beings even while he was pioneering the cause of conserving wildlife and the natural world. You wrote about Muir for The Atlantic recently. Can you tell us about that article and what you had to say about John Muir's legacy? Yeah, I think these arguments over over prominent people and their legacy really do. I mean, I think sometimes they can strike outsiders as sort of performative or are we just, you know, are we just arguing over statues and not really getting at the at the deeper issues, but in a way, I think they're an opportunity to get at the deeper, deeper issues. They really crystallize, you know, some of these long running prejudices and blind spots and strong points that we've been talking about. So I wrote an article for The Atlantic about John Muir a few months ago, and the, and the headline was Don't Cancel John Muir, and the subhead was But Don't Excuse Him Either. <laughs> and it was a little bit tongue in cheek, but it was also serious because, I, I mean, if if I do have a take home about these arguments, it's that most of these people were enormously prescient in important ways, and also enormously blinkered in other important ways. John Muir, you know, just had this, for his time, and I think still, still for our time, this very radical sense of empathy with other species, and this sense that, you know, they were other, he even referred to mosquitoes and gnats as small people, <laughs> you know, he was, and, and it, you know, in a really, he had a really charming way about, of writing about these species that, that made them really seem, you know, as he called them fellow beings. But, you know, as as has been well publicized, he struggled to have the same kind of empathy for other fellow humans. And some of what he wrote about the indigenous people of Yosemite was was quite insulting. But beyond the insulting language, I think almost the deeper insult was the implication that, as he wrote at one point, that a, a group of people he encountered seemed to have no right place in the landscape. So I think we could excuse some of his language as being, you know, of his time. But the idea that this place that he loved so much had no or very little human history or, or not, not worthwhile human history, I think that to me is what is damaging about Muir's legacy, you know, and, and that that, that is what has led the conservation movement to cause a lot of suffering and has also held the conservation movement back by, you know, limiting it to these top-down strategies, that, as we've been talking about, this sense that these places, these gorgeous landscapes, these diverse forests that conservationists are, are dedicated to protecting are, are blank slates, that they have no relationship with humans and should have no relationship with humans. That is something that I think, unfortunately, many of the people who follow in the footsteps of John Muir have have embraced either consciously or unconsciously. So, you know, I don't think, I think John Muir wrote some beautiful things. And, um, and he, in fact, I was just reading, rereading some of his work that he published in The Atlantic. And I think he brought attention to 
the rest of life to a public, you know, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, to the American public in a way that, you know, with a, with a force and, and with a passion that, you know, really it was unusual for his time and continues to really be quite remarkable. But I think also along with that, we need to acknowledge that his mindset and the people who have echoed his mindset have caused a lot of a lot of suffering and have held back the movement. And and you know, I think John Muir's his his views about indigenous people did evolve over his lifetime. And his defenders will say, well, he, you know, he might have thought that at one time, but he his views changed. But that idea of a a place without a human history, I, I he continued I think to suggest and imply and, and and describe the places he loved as places without human histories, and I think that that is worth the conservation movement really recognizing and reckoning with. So, and and E. O. Wilson uh, similarly, I feel that a lot of these a lot of conservationists have have huge empathy and insight about other species, but they're not so wise about their own species, about our own species. And I mean, I have E.O. Wilson's, I'm looking at E.O. Wilson's book right now, The Diversity of Life. And on the shelf below it, I have the book, Not in Our Genes, which was written as a response to E.O. Wilson's champion championing of sociobiology decades ago and, and the this kind of genetic essentialism that genetics determined behavior. And so Social scientists and social justice activists, I think, have recognized for a long time that E.O. Wilson was limited in that way um, and had a lot of wrongheaded ideas when it came to human communities and how humans worked. But those circles were very rarely in, in communication with the circles of people who just revered his insight about other species. And I think both of those perceptions of him were, were for the most part, accurate but they were almost never in conversation, which was so always was bewildering to me. And I think it's interesting that the latest round of conversation about him since his death is is maybe it's very sad, but perhaps productive in that it brings those conver- those conversations together and makes us look more closely at his contributions to the conservation of biodiversity, but also to look at some of his limitations because you know at the end of the day conservation is a human endeavor and conservationists have to have a sophisticated understanding of humans and how humans work (laughs) in order for conservation to work and you know people can have their own kind all the people can certainly have their own areas of expertise but they have to acknowledge where they're limited (laughs) and so I think we can learn a lot from still learn a lot from what E.O. Wilson knew and what he shared about other species and why they're important to us and why they're important to life on earth. But we can also recognize that that he wandered into or or deliberately threw himself into areas where he was not as qualified and not as wise and advanced a lot of ideas that were damaging. Well, thank you for that. I'm really glad to be having these conversations on this podcast. Just to wrap up our conversation today, what do you think the conservation establishment could do to more effectively support indigenous-led conservation? We've talked a lot about the problems in conservation. I will say that I felt more optimistic after finishing the process of writing Beloved Beast than I did when I started out. And part of that was, was my own reckoning with some of these biases and prejudices that I knew about but hadn't I think really face down myself. There's something rewarding about that, but also just recognizing what conservationists have accomplished. You know, in the 150 or so years that European and North American society finally recognized that it was possible for humans to drive species extinct, we have come a long way in our understanding of what other species need and how to protect them and there are a lot of species on earth today and in the ocean that are around because of the good work of conservation is because of the strengths of the conservation movement. So that to me is encouraging. We have a lot to build on what I think, as we've been talking about what the conservation movement has been slow to recognize and perhaps because it attracts a lot of people who've, whose strength is in science and in natural history, 
what we've been slow to recognize is that conservation is about people and it's about recognizing how people can play a positive role in conservation at every level, you know, at the local as well as the international. And so how can the conservation establishment support that at the local level? I think that I see the conservation establishment headed that way in many ways, and I think that's exciting. And I think, of course, there's a long way to go. We were just talking about the the debate over 30 by 30 and how there are many indigenous communities and indigenous leaders are extremely wary of what of what 30 by 30 might mean for them. But I think we're also seeing many international conservation groups realize that as grassroots activists have told them for generations, if you are someone coming into a community who is concerned about conservation, you have to recognize there's a lot of knowledge there already. (laughs) And your questions need to be, how can I support you rather than, you know, how can I, how can I help you do what I want you to do? (laughs) And so asking what people want, what they need, how can conservation is coming from outside, help communities protect species that they, that I think, I think, I hope (laughs) that we all have a desire to live alongside healthy communities of other species. And so I think if conservationists from the conservation establishment, professional conservationists can come into communities and, and start with the common interest of wanting to see healthy communities of humans and healthy communities of other species, and then say, how can we help you accomplish that? How can we make that job easier? Then we'll get a lot further than we have over the last 150 years. Now we're going to look much more closely at tribal conservation here in the United States. There are hundreds, maybe thousands, of incredible initiatives around the country led by Native American tribal peoples, despite the fact that there is no funding provided for these programs on an annual or ongoing basis by the federal government or state governments. I asked Dr. Julie Thorstensen, Executive Director for the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society, to give us a bit of the historic context for tribal conservation in the U.S. I don't know that I would call it conservation. It's more of a a relationship that tribes have with their surroundings or ecosystem. I mean, we tend to look, indigenous people tend to look more at things as all related, all together, interconnected, not outside, not looking out as an external. We don't, we don't really see our role as manager, I guess. And in, in fact, a lot of indigenous stories are, you know, creation stories and just teachings have the human as kind of the at the bottom really and that the the animals and nature is what kind of sacrifices so that the human can can survive so i think it's one of kind of evolving together i guess and coexisting rather than conservation i guess maybe the the history of the conservation kind of comes in after european encroachment and colonization when things started to disappear not only natural resources, but also indigenous people. And I think that relationship to the land and to nature and fish and wildlife, you know, I think that's probably where tribes tried to, tried to conserve that because it's, it's part of who they are and part of their culture and their teachings and their subsistence way of living. Right. And it is, of course, this cultural outlook of all life being interconnected, interrelated, that I think that conservationists and Western science really is finally starting to acknowledge with things like One Health, which views the health of the planet and all life on Earth holistically. In other words, the idea that human health and environmental health are really one and the same thing. So would you say that tribal peoples have always been actively working to preserve wildlife and the environment here in the U.S.? Or is there a sort of point in history where a more concerted movement began to build steam where tribal people started organizing what could be considered Western style conservation or management initiatives? Well, I think, you know, since colonization and since European contact, tribes have kind of been in a mode of survival for much of that. And, you know, you saw the, the different eras, the removal era and, and reservation era and the assimilation era, all of those. But perhaps it started with the Indian Self or Indian Reorganization Act of, I believe, 1935, somewhere in there when tribes kind of 
started to do more self-governing. And I know for my my home tribe here, um, I'm Lakota and I'm a citizen of the Shiner Sioux Nation in North Central South Dakota. And, and I think our first kind of management, I guess, of fish and wildlife would have been around when our constitution was formed. So around that time, probably in the, the early part of IRA. And, you know, it was with um, the issuing of fur bear licenses. So as far as like a larger movement, though, I, I like to think that it has something to do with the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society being established in, in 1983. And, and really that came up from that was a ground level effort and started, you know, our organization was formed by tribal fish and wildlife professionals. And it was formed kind of in the era where tribes were, were winning uh, cases, legal cases that were reaffirming their hunting and fishing jurisdiction and their rights. And we had a group of, of tribal fish and wildlife biologists around the nation that saw that, you know, we really needed a place for, for these professionals to, to get together and network and be able to raise these issues to a national level. So that's how the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society was formed. You know, we've been working, we have seven regions, we're a member organization we have 227 support tribes, which means we have 227 individual tribes that have issued a, a resolution of support over the years. And I think that's that's pretty impressive considering there are 574 fairly recognized tribes in the United States. So I, I like to say that it's it kind of started then in the 80s. And I think it's just continuing as you see more tribal citizens become um, educated and just more ab- self advocacy, you know, advocating for tribes, advocating for indigenous lifestyles and culture, and also for the fish and wildlife resources that are so integral to those processes. You spoke with a Manga Bay reporter last November about how, unlike state agencies, the U.S. federal government doesn't support tribal fish and wildlife management programs. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing in comparison to what the state and federal government receive for tribes. So states receive Pittman-Robertson and Dingle-Johnson funds, which are excise taxes on uh, hunting and fishing equipment and ammo. And, you know, they get those those taxes go back to the states through a distribution formula, and they use that to do their, their fish and wildlife management. One thing that's really important to note is that those distribution formulas are based on population size and land base size, which includes tribal citizens and tribal lands. So, you know, tribes are, tribes are, have been excluded from those dollars and have tried several times to try and get those amended so tribes can be included. Other, I guess one thing that the tribes did kind of were successful was in the early 2000s, the state and tribal wildlife grant programs were formed and that's funding for tribes for fish and wildlife management. The, the problem with that is it's just not adequate enough funding. It's, you know, it's around four to six million dollars a year. And while fish and wildlife has done a great job of getting those dollars out into Indian country, I think supporting almost 600 projects. The, the real issue is there's there's just no base funding for tribes for fish and wildlife management. And then you get tribes that are piecemealing their programs together. Uh, we have one tribe that reported that they have 12 grants that they have to report on and have to, you know, kind of hustle for to keep their program afloat. So it really is really hard to build on that program when you're reliant on grant funding. There are some, I mean, there are federal funds through the the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Fish and Wildlife that tribes can access, but they're just, it's not this, it's not in the same manner that the Pittman Robertson Dingle Johnson funds are, meaning that there's nothing that that's just equitably distributed across all 574 tribes. There are tribes that that receive some base funding from from the BIA, but not all tribes. Yet those 574 tribes manage about 140 million acres in the U.S. Is that right? Yeah, they own or influence that much. I think I think the BIA uh, figure it for the tribal land ownership is around 56.2 million acres. But then you have Alaska Natives that are essentially landless, but do have some influence over the management. So you've talked a bit about the founding and history of the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society, but could you tell us more about your work? Sure. So, you know, it's it's a huge, a huge uh, feat, really, because there are 574 fairly recognized tribes and they're unique. They all have different needs and 
uh, different concerns, but you know, overwhelmingly, our we provide technical service. It's one of the um, technical assistance, technical services, and one of our most alarming, I guess not alarming, but one of our most prominent requests for technical assistance is helping tribes identify funding sources. So we're we're trying to empower tribal fish and wildlife professionals and programs by helping them because we know they're understaffed, we know they're they're underfunded. So we try some of the things we try to do is identify resources. We try to do a lot of networking and connection. You know, we we do focus. We have some national initiatives that we focus on that are maybe more high higher level that will affect more tribes on a whole, such as Recovering America's Wildlife Act. We our two, 2022 national initiatives include Recovering America's Wildlife Act, uh, Tribal Wildlife uh, Corridors and Connectivity, which includes the Tribal Wildlife Corridors Act. The other ones are Wildlife Health and Climate Change and 30 by 30, and then uh, Tribal Conservation Law Enforcement Program Enhancement. We feel like, like overall, these these five national initiatives, you know, affect a lot more tribes on the whole. And so we try to focus on that. We do trainings, we do conferences. It's been a lot more difficult during the pandemic, but we've done a lot of uh, kind of roundtable type of listening sessions. And then we have a, a really strong youth or education component. And we've been building on that since we hired um, Ashley Carlisle she began in December of 2019, and she's really she's really taken that development of the education program just one step further. She does a professional development webinar monthly. Uh, we added interns last year. We do a summer youth practicum that we did last year, and we will do again this year. Scholarships, you know, trying to identify. We do we we try to house a lot of the opportunities on our website so that. Native students that are looking for opportunities and natural resources can go to one place. So there's there's a lot of good work going on and there are a lot of opportunities, but you, you kind of have to know where to look. So we're trying to take some of that, some of that research and that legwork we try to take out and do that for for our members and for, for tribes so that they can just kind of come and, and find things in one easy place. We've done advocacy work. We, you know, we try to connect tribes with different resources and chances to get their name name out and talk about the work they're doing. We're also working on research and publications and how tribal perspectives and tribal authorship should be incorporated into that. So we have a lot going on. We just recently added, uh, or we just recently received the, the BIA Tribal Climate Resilience Grant for the Alaska region. So we, we're hiring three climate, tribal climate liaisons in Alaska and, and hof- hoping to expand our services to our Alaska native tribes. And we're hiring invasive species coordinators. We'll be dealing with invasive species. We have a seed uh, chronic wasting disease project that we provide training and equipment and some sampling costs for tribes. So, you know, we're just trying to help make their, their jobs easier. Could you tell us about some of that work? What are some of the most exciting or emblematic fish and wildlife programs tribes are doing right now? That article I mentioned earlier discusses the black-footed ferret. I'd love to hear more about that and any other projects you think our listeners should hear about. Yeah, I mean, I've I've said this before several times that you can basically name any type of fish and wildlife conservation work our species and i can probably find you a tribe working on it i mean we're we've got tribes that are working on on the oceans we've got tribes that are working in deserts we've got tribes working in everglades we've got tribes working on plains it just it's such a, a great wealth of of work i guess that tribes are doing yeah the black footed ferret i mean that's something that i personally worked on early in my career when i was a tribal wildlife biologist that effort i think is been largely uh, successful due to tribal involvement. There are several tribes in South Dakota, Wyoming, and Arizona that have helped with that effort. And there, I mean, there's numerous, numerous and threatened and endangered species projects that occur on tribal lands. One of them that I can mention is the, uh, the Southern Ute tribe of Southern Colorado. They're doing a project with New Mexico meadow jumping mouse. I hope that's right. Uh, and they've been they've been largely uh, instrumental in, in data collection for that species. And also, you know, you've already I, you already did a story on the Yurok tribe and California condor. 
That's a huge one. Yes, we did do a story on that. Check the show notes for a link to an article and a previous episode of this podcast about the Yurok tribe's efforts to restore the California condor on their land. There are several uh, species, bat species and thinking fish, salmon recovery has been, tribes have been very instrumental in that. Bison recovery, tribes have kind of led the front on that as well. I think one of one of the the newest ones is the the Rappahannock tribe of Virginia just received federal recognition in 2018 and one of the first things they did was establish a department of environmental services in the end of 2020 and already they've they've contributed crucial you know traditional ecological knowledge of historic river herring passageways and and these are culturally important and threatened species so i think there's there's just a lot of there's a lot of work going on. I, I could probably I could probably talk all day on the work that tribes are doing around conservation and I would hate to I would hate to leave somebody out because I feel like almost every one of them is is doing something that's really important to to the overall species res- restoration and conservation. I wanted to ask you to tell us more about the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Could you tell us about the status of that bill and its potential for funding tribal fish and wildlife management programs? Yeah, so there's a there's a House and a Senate bill. House bill is two seven seven three and um, has 162 co sponsors, so that's encouraging. And the Senate bill, which this is the first time we've seen a Senate bill, is two three seven two, and it has 32 bipartisan co sponsors. The House bill has been through the House of Natural Resource Committee and and through a markup. The Senate uh, Senate bill went through the Environmental Public Works hearing in December. And so, you know, we're, we're encouraged that it seems to be a lot of support for, for tribes. It's, it's just, it's, I can't even describe how, how much of a difference it'll make in Indian country for fish and wildlife management. You know, the tribal, there's a separate tribal title and it has $97.5 million for tribes. And that can be used for, you know, fish and wildlife management, threatened endangered species, culturally, important species to tribe, conservation law enforcement. Uh, I believe there's some outdoor recreation. So there's, there's just, um, you know, for tribes, it's, there's just so much diversity within tribal fish and wildlife programs. We have tribes that are, that are large and have a large land base and have a, a well-established fish and wildlife program and, and they're doing great work. And we have tribes that are just starting are are trying really hard to to get their fish and wildlife programs developed and further them. So I, I think it's really, it's just going to be a, a huge game changer for fish and wildlife management in Indian country. And, uh, you know, we're really looking forward to its passage and what that will mean for tribes to have this base funding where they can build capacity and, you know, con- continue to do the work they're doing once they are at, at a somewhat of a more equitable funding level. As I mentioned before, Tribes have tried in the past to to kind of rectify this this inequality in funding and and tried to get Pittman Robertson amended and, and tried uh, through a couple other bills to to establish some type of base funding for fish and wildlife programs and just haven't been successful and and I think a lot of it had to do with you know just kind of doing it on their own but but the one thing I will say about the difference in recovering and is that we're seeing we're seeing states and tribes at the table together and supporting each other uh, along with a lot of other NGOs and and different nonprofits that and you know the business sector and and a lot of different uh, representation in this in this group that that have been supporting recovery in America's Wildlife Act and I think that's the difference I know that you know there are states and tr- there are states that have passed resolutions of support for the tribal title which is which is great and there are states that have signed support letters with tribes, and that's just not something we've really seen a lot. So that's that's really encouraging. I I feel that we're seeing that, and and I think maybe we're just all finally realizing that, uh, you know, fish and wildlife don't respect our political boundaries, and to be successful in the overall restoration conservation of species and and of our ecosystem, like we have to work together. So hopefully this is, um, you know, this is a a step forward, but it's always been hard to, for tribes to, you know, it's, I don't, it's not that they don't want to participate, but we realistically have one man departments and the amount of things that they need to be working on 
um, the responsibilities they have not only to the, the fish and wildlife resources and the natural resources, but also the responsibilities they may have to their tribe or, um, you know, they might be getting uh, requests for consultation and, and, and questions. And it's just, it's kind of overwhelming. So I think just having that funding, it'll just kind of start to level the playing field a little bit. Any final thoughts on the importance of funding for tribal fish and wildlife programs and why tribal-led conservation is so important right now? Well, I th- like I said before, I think tribes have a kind of this unique look on things. And I think that that type of holistic view has uh, been happening on tribal lands and in Indian country, but maybe been left out of the overall conservation movement. And I think that that's super important. But like I mentioned, if you're not at capacity, you know, (laughs) are you're competing when you're competing against other tribes, you're constantly competing for funding. It's, it's just really hard to, to get everything you want to get accomplished done. So I, I think that just by having some type of annual dedicated secure funding that tribes can count on, that then they can build and, and that, you know, there will still need, there will still be a need for grant funds and for project funds, but just having that, that secured funding will be just a game changer for Indian country. If you enjoy the Manga Bay newscast, we ask that you please help spread the word by telling a friend. That's the best way to help expand our reach and keep the show growing. Another way to help is by becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com slash manga bay. We are a nonprofit news outlet, and just a dollar or more per month would really help us offset production costs and hosting fees. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, please head to patreon.com slash manga bay to learn more and support the Manga Bay newscast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash manga bay. You and your friends can join the listeners who've downloaded the Manga Bay Newscast more than a quarter of a million times by subscribing to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. Or you can download our app for Apple and Android devices. Just search either app store for the Manga Bay Newscast app to gain fingertip access to new shows and all of our previous episodes. And of course, you can read all of our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com. Or if you prefer to keep up with us on social media, follow us at facebook.com slash manga bay or on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle is at manga bay on both those platforms. Thanks as always for listening to the manga bay newscast. I'm your host, Mike Garecki, signing off. Talk to you again in two weeks. <laughs>